Hello. Hi, is this Krista? It is. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. She is an actress. She is a documentarian and a journalist. And we are very, very excited to welcome the one and only Krista Erickson to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Krista. Hi. Thank you, Terry and Tiffany. I'm very honored to be your guest tonight. Well, I'm very happy to say... I congratulate you on the win of your favorite candidate, Joe Biden, as president. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> very, very, very hard fought win, yeah. especially in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Pennsylvania caused a little trouble there, didn't they? Well, we didn't cause too much trouble, but. Uh, Apparently, we caused trouble for the rest of the GOP party. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, if, if we can uh, be safe in, in hoping that uh, Trump's not going to blow up the world and press the buttons until then, we'll be good after that inauguration. Whew. Well, we'll see. But, you know, it's like we're in you know the countdown to Christmas, the 12 days to Christmas. You right, know? right. It's, it's kind of like that. Yeah. What's, what's your dog's name? I love pets on cult radio. <laughs> yeah, I know. He, he surprises me, too. He <laughs> is, is, is Phineas Blue. Aww. And he is a 10-month-old Cocker Spaniel. Oh, oh you got a puppy on your hands. Yes. Uh, my first male, too. My <laughs> first boy. Yeah, we've we've had Cocker... We had, we had uh, years ago, we had a brother and sister cocker spaniel that got brought home as puppies and that was a, a that was a trial of patience <laughs> it, it really it really is like having children it you is. get uh, you know baby animals is just like having a kid yeah <laughs> it is right. but anyway i wanted to start this because you've had such a great career and done a lot of things i want to encompass the whole thing if we can the acting and into the journalism you have certainly done a lot to be proud for one of the many people out there that proved that you were blessed with everything because usually people get either looks or talent and brains you got all of it and and you've done some incredible work uh we actually screened again last night and i'm hearing from the audience out there it was also one of their favorite films too what was the experience for you in doing Little Darlings? Because that was your big breakout thing in 1980, right? Oh, my God, yes. I mean, I can't believe people remember that. But <laughs> it, it, it was. Yes, it was. I mean, to remember that experience, I can barely remember that experience, yeah. much less to have anybody remember it. And I'm so honored. I'm so honored when, when uh, I hear that. Um. You know, I mean, it was another time. I mean, if you think about that now, we got the, you know, we got the forbidden R rating yeah. for right. that movie. Right. That, that was an R rating for that film. Can you imagine? We get a G now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and it killed us. You know, it 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 killed us. We were, it was still popular, but um, that R rating uh, we expected a PG. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, that killed half of the, uh, popularity of the film because of that R rating. You know, the thing about the film, and I told this to actress, uh, Glennis O'Connor, who's one of my favorites, owed to Billy Joe and stuff. She thought, Oh my God, what a great movie. Yes, oh yeah. yeah. And, and, and I told her that it was an important film because it had a great message and so did Little Darlings because it had heart. And it had a great message, and, and I guess that's why it got the R rating, because it was a little controversial, and it really taught a morality lesson to young girls when they're facing peer pressure like that. That's right. That's so, right. So, let me ask you, though, I mean, how, talk a little bit about the process of getting involved in, in the film, the audition process or whatever, because from my understanding, from what I've read... You started out as kind of a, a lifetime member of, of the Actors Studio, right? That, that was in 1978. But was Little Darlings like your very first thing? And what did it feel like walking onto a set with names like Christy McNichol and Tatum O'Neill, who was one of the youngest Academy Award winners? Well, let me start you with, um, I didn't start with the Actors Studio. I ended with the Actors Studio. Okay. Okay. So um, that was my goal, and I actually, you know, didn't feel I even deserved to be really an actor until I earned my 
way uh, into the actor's studio because that's the legacy I came from. Right. You know, my my, my godfather started the actor's studio. Um, you mentioned you know, my, his my name, too. You got some famous relatives. Yes. So my, my godfather was Aria Kazan, mm. and uh, he was, you know, one of the mem- members, he, he began the actor studio, right. and he used to always, you know, hang out in my grandfather's apartment in the Dakota. Uh, my grandfather was a set designer, his name was Joe Melvina, and, you know, nowadays they don't think of a set designer as being very well known. But because my grandfather changed the shape of the theater, um, you know, in Tennessee Williams was always at the apartment, uh, Patty Chayefsky and, and Josh Logan, and, and you know, the, uh, I, I can't remember, I mean, so many names. My grandfather actually threw out, uh, not so my grandfather, my dad actually threw out um, Elia and um, Tennessee. Mm. One time, <laughs> out of my 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 grandfather's apartment because he thought they were bums, oh. <laughs> and had somehow yep, and had somehow gotten into his father-in-law's scotch, and um, you know he found out later that he had just you know thrown out the greatest one of the greatest screenwriters, one of the greatest directors of. <laughs> oh ever. my god! Wow. Uh, no. Um. But so little darlings, you know, at the time, and by the way, I, I, I earned my way uh, into the actor studio. And, and, you know, one of the things is you don't study at the actor studio. It's that's a misnomer. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to audition right. for it and you have to get past some pretty serious uh, names. Um, you know, I failed the first time and I got through in the second. But, you know, when I first entered acting um we i did ask my godfather for some help and he i asked for a letter uh for recommendation and he said why should i give you a letter for recommendation i haven't seen your acting oh Oh. yeah so yep so there was going to be no help coming from him and people think that they Um, they do they don't often help uh we we know david carrying's daughter and she asked her dad for help he was like get a job you know like i'm not going to help you they don't always yeah, help yeah. you no no yeah and he was really uh uh you know he he was tough oh wow. he's tough so little darlings uh, at the time at the time i was actually just a, a, a you know a model yeah mm-hmm. i mean that was my big thing i was just i love modeling i just really didn't care less about acting so the kind of character that Ron Maxwell was looking for, with the exception of being, you know, what we would now call a narcissist, um, I was pretty close to that character. You know, the outcast, uh, you know, the big model, but... Are, are you trying to tell me you were mean? <laughs> no, I, no, no, yeah. That's the only thing I wasn't. Okay, I didn't, uh, I didn't think that's so. That's the only thing I wasn't. But I was kind of grown up for my age, yeah. and you know, I, I had like adult boyfriends. And, but I, I had no idea I was actually going to get the role. I, I auditioned for it on a lark, uh-huh. um, and the next thing I know, I, you know, I got it. And I, I always think that's probably why I got it, is right. because I didn't care, you know, if I got it. Right. Well, you know, I love camp movies, and and it was is fun, and also had a good message. But what about getting all those kids i imagine you were all around 15 i'm not sure where your exact age was but was it really kind of like being at camp and doing that film i take it you were at a real camp we were at a real camp yes we were um i think it was kind well the only time we felt like we were in a real camp was when we were in the middle of nowhere georgia yeah um and we were stuck at like a motel six (laughs) <laughs> kind of thing um, for for eight weeks <laughs> and whatever we we always wanted to be on the set the, otherwise you know you were stuck in the hotel right and you know I, that was like the place to be because there was nothing else around there and you knew when you you know lunch in the hotel were always going to be you, this is the 
typical Georgian, you know, so what you going to have on the side today? <laughs> we got or we got beans. <laughs> I, I I know the feeling. I've been to Georgia. It's, it's exactly like. That. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yes. You know what I'm saying. Yes. Um. So I was we just like begged, you know, to like, oh please get me, let me be called today. I'd rather just be sit <laughs> sit around in my trailer, you know, than <laughs> you know, be at the motel six with all of this. You know, God. Yeah. Um. I mean, luckily a lot, you know, changed. Thank God, but yeah. not the world. Right. No. Not the world, not so, the world frame of mind. That's so, for sure. Now, now being together um, with, with all those girls and everything, I, I mean, did you guys get along pretty well? Was it pretty much like you were really at summer camp? I know you had a couple of girls in, in the fact of uh, you know Tatum and and others that, and that had pretty big names at yeah. the time, Chrissy McNichol. Well, and because there's also Chris a very and I did not get along at all. I was sorry. What was Chris that? And I did not. Not uh, at all. Oh. Um. Probably because I called her a lesbian. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that didn't... Uh, and then so she broke my wrist as a result. Really? So like, that, yeah. Yeah. We were playing volleyball. And I, I, I she was on, we were on the other sides of the team. And I got angry and I called her out. Called, called her a lesbian. <laughs> and, um, you know, she wasn't out then. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, the fact that her... You know, her best friend was down there, and we kind of knew. Yeah. Um, it, and so she she threw the volleyball at me really, really hard, and I I put my hand out, you know, and it just it broke. But, you know, at that time, we were like, everybody was 14, 15. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a time when, you know, you just, you're so confused about yourself you're so confused, especially girls. Right. Uh, you know, we were all just in our own teenage angst. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was really hard for us to to communicate with each other. You know, we were all we were. That's the problem. Is we we're all in our own um, having our own problems, just being human, who we were, yeah, being makes girls. Sense. Right. Sure. So um, I don't think. You know, Tatum and I, I think, have had the longest off and on friendship um, of all of them. Are you talking with and you or with you or? Yeah, with me. Okay. With me. I mean, of, of all of the girls, sadly, you know, we lost Alexa uh -huh. um, in a, a long time ago. Um, but, you know, and of course, Cynthia, you know, God bless her, looked look, uh what's become of her I'm so proud of her but I didn't you know I just didn't get to um, know Cynthia uh, so well uh, she just you know didn't have um, but Tatum and I because I went to Los Angeles afterwards uh, for that TV show so Tatum and I stayed in touch well that's good and she, she had a hard I, life too Tatum had a hard life yeah, it didn't seem so yeah. uh, in the beginning, but and our friendship certainly had ups and downs, to say the least. Um, but again, you know, it, it starts out with you know girls, you know, in competition with each other, hurting each other, um, you know, then coming to the other side and then you become women, and then you know you make mistakes. And then you make bigger mistakes, and then you know you you get divorces, and then mm -hmm. you step into traps, and then you overcome them, and then you become mothers, and then you know you you help each other out, and then you betray each other, and then you're older, and you're going wow, and we're still here, yeah. and and that's what um, you know, and that's what lasts, I guess. You so know, that's so what I guess. A journey I guess Tatum really wasn't like she could have been so conceited because of Paper Moon and the success and everything, but I guess she was fairly down to earth. Well, she went through a period where she she was pretty terrible, mm -hmm. you know, where she she was pretty awful. Um, but I mean, how when you get when your father is who Ryan was, yeah, and 
Ryan had his terrible twos as well. Um, and then you, know, you get an Academy Award at that young age. Right. Uh, you know, that is a very, very... And then, you know, we just make flop after flop. Um, that is a very, very... Who can handle that? Yeah. Right. You know, that is very, very difficult. It is. That's a very difficult thing to shoulder. Um, you know, I don't think people have any idea how hard that is. Um, the fact that she has is where she is now and that she's found the peace and the happiness yeah. is that that is success. Yeah. That's yeah. success. Yeah. Well, I'm not really surprised here about Christy. She's kind of reclusive. We tried to get her on and our request was intercepted by her brother Jimmy McNichol who wanted to come on the show in her place but uh, I, I'm not really surprised to hear what I'm hearing What's that? McNichol? Yeah, uh, uh, Jimmy, her brother he wanted to come on instead uh, of Christy We asked Christy to come on and Jimmy was like Christy can't come on your show but I really want to come on let me come on instead <laughs> and we were like, no, that's okay <laughs> Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. Oh but God. during the production, knowing you know the theme of the show and everything, I know how girls like to sit around and talk. D did you girls ever really talk about the movie and what it was about and, and what you thought about it, what it meant to you as far as the morality thing involved? No. No? Isn't that weird? No. no. Well, there yeah. you go. Well, I, There were so many great scenes. i, I got to ask you about the food fight. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, awful, awful day. Oh my God! That is something that will. I think if we all saw that again, in fact, I think when we do, I still think we get a little like tickle in our throat, you know, of like a little bit of you know vomit starts to come up. You know, everybody thinks stuff like that is fun, but I've I've done a few things like that on film for shows. And it's with really the, uncomfortable it, because <laughs> it's all over you, and the sun's out, and it's hot, and there's multi takes, and there's and you, lights, and oh, yeah. you feel that's it. right. So what was that's it? Right. Pretty it's, controlled, it's or entire, was it? A, it's an entire day, and you're inside. You know, of a you're inside of a controlled set yeah. with hot, hot lights, no air with gel on the windows <laughs> and the first time you know what's called the master shot yeah right is great that's fun they're like go crazy everybody and then you do and you go crazy and then they do what's called the two shot you know where they go okay no you have the pancake like right there <laughs> like, well, you have to throw it like like there you have to throw it and then the juice and the poor person who's in that shot has to get like the pancake yeah. you know thrown on them over and over and over and over again you know to hit that exact spot where they had hit before and you know by the top by the tenth time you know it's getting disgusting not to mention that you know by the fourth hour you know the milk and the oatmeal uh. and butter uh. you know is starting to smell yeah. really bad and by the eighth hour, you know, you can imagine in a 140 degree room what an entire cabin of dairy <laughs> smells like. I think you probably yeah. have a whole new respect for the Three Stooges, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Definitely. Well, well one more scene i got to ask you about. We'll move on to other things in your life. Is my other favorite scene, my, my other favorite character in the movie was the actress that played the little hippie girl, Sunshine. And I love the yeah, scene where she yeah. just she just clocked you right in the face. How did that go? Would it turn out well? Or I, I mean, I can't believe it turned out well. You know, because <laughs> it was, I did because it was a mile away. You know, she wasn't even close. Right. 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 And you know, so I was like, oh, that looks really good. <laughs> she, she was nowhere close. Yeah. To me, so I really didn't think that it would it would. Show. Yeah. Uh, but that's Cynthia. Can you believe that Cynthia Nixon, Sex in the City? Yeah. Cynthia Nixon? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, she did great stuff she's, afterwards. She's, she's gone on to big things. I loved her character. Well, she sure did. 
Yeah. You, you know, as far as little darlings, and like I said, I will move on. Uh, how do you think it plays today? I mean, because morality and girls have changed so much. I, it's almost like a Cheech and Chong movie isn't relevant anymore because marijuana is legal, and, and and now girls don't think as much of a big deal about having sex at fifteen as they did back then. You think yeah. it still stands the test of time, or? I think it should. Yeah, it should. I think it should. I really should. I think they still go through it. I think human beings don't change. Right. Yeah. And just just because time is sped up uh, doesn't mean the emotions and the feelings have not. Yeah. So, I mean, thank God, as much as I dislike Ron Maxwell personally, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because of his, I'd say his politics, but um, I think it goes deeper than politics. Um, I... I, I give him respect for one thing, which is he never allowed a remake yeah. um, of, of Little Darling, because it can't. Yeah. How can you do that? How can yeah. you remake that? Yeah. Um, but I still think it, it, it does, because it, it would, it, those are the feelings that people, that children, I mean, that child, God, that girls and, and boys and young women uh, uh, still go through. There's no, there's no changes in that. Yeah. There's no, you know, you still think you're grown up when you're not, and you're still, uh, you know, playing games when you're not. Uh, I mean, when you're too, when you're scared to death, um, you're still trying to prove things. But I see women doing that in right. their forty. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So I, I absolutely stand the test of time, and I think if any girl saw that. Now, uh, they would still uh, feel the same way. Right. Absolutely. So how many girls did you, on the set do you think had a crush on Matt Dillon? Oh, every girl in Georgia did. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. My God, that poor boy could not walk through. But I think something else, had, uh, one of his movies had just come out before then, mm-hmm. before Little Darlings. I can't remember what it was. Um, and they were crazy for him. <laughs> I think, I think Christy kind of had a little bit of a thing, maybe. Wow, he, he must have had some major power then. I mean, that's, that's yeah, great. Wow. Yeah, I think, you know, because she was going through such a confusing time, but I think she was so teased about it relentlessly, yeah. um, <laughs> that, you know, that was kind of nipped in the bud. That's yeah. kind of sad, but. Um, I think that, 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 you know, again, I, if any of the girls did, uh, they got this for themselves, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we were really, believe it or not, even though we were 15, uh, 14, I was 14. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, 13, 14, Jen was Thompson. My God, have you seen photos of Jen Thompson now? No, I haven't, oh. no. Oh my God! She's like a knockout <laughs> woman. My God! Uh, you know, this is it, we just we're still professional actors. Yeah. So you know who all that you know all that gossip you know all that stuff that we played in the film was not who we were off set. Sure. Off set, we were professional actors. So, if anybody you know had a crush on an actor or something like that, it, it didn't it didn't show. Yeah. The only, if anything, we were really disappointed who was who played ended up playing Gary. Mm. Really? Why is that? They're like, who's this? Who's this foreign guy? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then when he took his when he took his shirt off in the swimming pool, right? You know, and he had hair hair on his shoulders. And and Tatum was like, ah! I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking it might be a little easier for Tatum's character to achieve her goal than it would have been Christie's because I, I think, you know, uh, it would have been easier for for Matt. 
Yeah, but girls. Been easier for me. But girls that age do that. We were talking about that the other night. When you're 15, you totally think you could get the 35 year old uh, teacher. I think like, it would have been harder. Like, yeah, what's the problem? It would have been a little harder to get the teacher. He would have went to prison. You know, <laughs> <laughs> all that kind yeah. of stuff. Wow. I, I feel sorry for those. You know, for those. 25, 30-year-old teachers. Because, yeah. You know, <laughs> those, 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 you know, 16-year-old girls, 15-year-old girls can be, you know, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's like uh, that. It, it is like that. I mean, I used to do uh, DJ shows at junior highs, and, and the girls would be all over you, and you knew that couldn't happen, and they were all very flirty, yeah. and they're in, they're in such a hurry to grow up, right. you know? And it, it's, That's it's, right. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel I've gone full circle because we had a show a couple of years ago. Uh, we had an actress here that was in the studio for four hours, and you kind of replaced her, and that's Donna Wilkes on the show Hello, yeah. Larry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Now, one of my uh, hosts on the station here, that's like one of his favorite shows of all time. So what was it like coming in and replacing Donna Wilkes? Was there pressure? A lot of actresses say there's pressure for coming in when somebody's exiting because, like, it's all new and everything. What was it like for you in the first days of the set of Hello, Larry? I I hated it. Really? I, I hated it. I, I did not want to do the show, I'm sorry to say. Um, I was, ju- I mean, Little Darlings was just about to come out. I knew... I was going to get the reviews, you know, I knew, uh, they were already talking in New York, and all over, the talk was all over Los Angeles, all over, you know, that I was going to do the standout, um, and uh, I, you know, was just waiting for it to come out, and I was going to be able to, you know, have my choice of what I was going to do next, and unfortunately, um, I was kind of bamboozled. Yeah into uh, doing this type of show, the type of show that I hated. You mean a sitcom? Uh, oh, that's that, but that type of sitcom, too. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that big laugh, you know, that everything I hated. And uh, I, I, that's why, I, you know, of course I got it, because I didn't want it, once again. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I had no idea who I was replacing. And Tara was on top of that, I also was going, because I hated it, because I resented it, because I didn't want to be in Los Angeles, um, I was also, you know, going through a, a drug problem of my, of my own. Mm-hmm. So I had no idea who I was replacing or why. So when they told me, uh, I just went <clears throat> out of the frying pan, you know. <laughs> um, and... It, and of course, they found out very shortly. Yeah, out of the frying pan into the fire, mm-hmm. and you know, and they were like, "Oh, we can't fire second one," <laughs> so they were stuck. <laughs> they were stuck with me. Um, but you know, looking back on Hello, Larry, once again, not having still had acting lessons, uh, acting lessons yet, um, I look back on what Donna did. Finally, you know, years later, and my work, and I have to tell you, I thought Donna was much better than I was. Really? Well, I like your yep. stuff too. You know, Donna did some good work, like like Angels, like my favorite movie of all time. I don't know if you ever seen Angel, but uh, I, I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know you're a friend with her on Facebook. You guys talk? Uh, we kind of say hello back and forth, but not so much. Um, you know, I have, I just, I have respect. <clears throat> for Donna, you know. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I, I reached out to her and, you know, so we're more like just Facebook friends, but... Well, she certainly um, owns it because uh, she talked about how wild she was and and, and and she really has turned herself around, that's for sure. And I'm, I'm sorry to hear you had a problem. I'm glad you turned yourself around. Everything's okay. Well, the best thing is, is you know, what's, what's kind of ironic is I was, you know, horribly teased by all, all, all of the NBC, you know, girls. Mm-hmm. All the NBC good girls. Hmm. You know. I mean, um, are you talking about, like, <laughs> from the sitcom world, like, different strokes people, all maybe? Or? All of them. Mm-hmm. I, I won't name them all, but, more, but especially the ones who were, you know, who were supposed to be, like, the really good girls. Uh-huh. Um, and the, you know, the, 
the uh, real big stars. I'll just put it that way. Um, all of them. Um, and I even was, oh, look, she's got a drug problem. She's right. gonna have that. And I was, I was clean by the time I was, you know, 18 years old. Yeah. And, you know, I, I saw all of them after in the next, like, you know, in their adult years, go through drug and alcohol problems. Right. They had to go into rehabs, you know, and I'm just doing karma, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, much, it's way more difficult than your adulthood. Um, I was a teenager, for Christ's sake. I was a child, you know. And I was I was already gave that all that up while I was still 18 years old. Well, I know you did and different strokes. I mentioned that. I, Dana Plato had a whole lot of trouble. Look at what wound up, unfortunately, yeah. happened with her, you know. That was uh, that was very hard on yeah. on all of us, and I I tandem PAT had an especially high rate of um, and that that particular production company had a high rate a mortality rate, yeah, uh, which would be interesting if anyone wrote a book about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've got to ask you because my my friend I told you is a big fan of the show. What about McLean Stevenson? What do you think of him? He, it's a, it looks like to be quite temperamental. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd heard that. You know, it, it depended upon the day. You know, he could be, it just depended upon the day. He right. could be nice, and he could be not so nice. Uh, it depended upon his mood. Right. I think that's, so I would say, uh, I am grateful um, that I got to know who Ruth Brown was yeah. later after the show ended. I didn't know it while I was on the show, but a couple of years later when I was seeing somebody who was um, uh, a jazz singer and I got to understand how great uh, uh, a legend Ruth Brown was. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was able to appreciate it because she, of course, she didn't tell anybody because nobody cared. Right. Um, and I didn't. Uh, that's crazy. You know? She's I, a legend and nobody cared, you know? I mean, wow. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And she didn't, she was so humble and quiet. All she wanted to do was work it through the day and go home. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad that I, you know, while she was still alive and I was still young enough to be able to say, my God. I had no idea. You're so. I'm, I listened to your music, and now I know how great you are. And yeah. I could see the the grateful. She was so grateful. I could see it in her eyes that I recognized her. You know that this somebody she worked with had you know had recognized who she was, right. who she had been, uh, her and the level of greatness that that I was so glad I was able to do that for her. Um, that that was important for me. Um, mm. Joanna was uh, another one that I always knew had a talent way too big for that show. And uh, Metalark, I loved him dearly. Metalark and, Lemon. Uh, Yep. Oh my God! I, I I met him when I was a kid. It was such a big deal for him. He was so nice to the kids. What a nice, <clears throat> nice man. We always dreaded, you know, when he was on the show. <laughs> because we knew it would be a long night. <laughs> you know, he just, he could not get his line. He, he, he just couldn't do it. Yeah. So, you know, we'd have, like, the first show and the second show, and then we'd have pickups. I don't know. Back then, I don't know if your other guests have, have told you how this worked, but... Back then, we had, it was a four-camera show, mm-hmm. and we the first show with a live audience, and then we do a second show, uh, and then if there, were any, it was, if there was anything that was missed, we would do something called pickups. Yeah. Right. And most of the time, you know, we, we'd have very few pickups afterwards. We'd just, like, let's get home. But if Meadowlark... <laughs> 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 on. 
we knew it was we were no one was getting home before midnight. Right. So that was for sure. <laughs> and most of the time they kept the no. Sometimes they kept the audience a little bit <laughs> a little bit late after the second show. And God bless them. You know they would be so. You know they would laugh. I uh, they would stay and laugh over and over and over again while you know Metal Arts would just blow his lines <laughs> over and over and over again. And if all else failed, he would bring out a basketball and spin it on his right. finger, and it, it'd all be That's okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, That's so right. one of the things that that I I have to ask you about because I absolutely love this film. And the co-star that you worked with cracks me up. I've been trying to track him down for a long time. Um, but I saw also that you posted on Facebook about it not too long ago. And that is the film Jekyll and Hyde Together Again. Uh, can you talk what? a little bit about the film and Mark and what you thought the film was going to be versus what it, how it ended up performing and what happened there? Mm. Wow. That that what I well that film, <laughs> unfortunately that's a film that like destroyed my career. Unfortunately, um, that film made me lose Flashdance. Yeah, I heard yeah, about what that. Happened? What because happened? We, we had the choreographer of Flashdance on, and, and I, I guess you were toe and toe for getting the Jennifer Beals role, right? That's right. I was supposed to get Jennifer Beals role. Wow. So I was I was his choice, his number one choice. And because Jekyll and Hyde was supposed to be their release for the summer to be the big hit, and it turned out that, you know, word was around Paramount that it was going to be this, a big bomb and a stinker. Um, you know, the stink uh, gets passed around, and even though it had nothing to do with me, right? you know, um, uh, you know it just gets, you know, the, the stink goes to everybody. Yeah. Well, um, and unfortunately, the the studio said no. Where do you wanna. where do you think it went wrong? Because from my from based on what you said in the post, you know they kind of were you know going on the heels of the slapstick success of like Airplane. So that's right. Why do you think it, it missed the mark? What do you think happened? Well, if you just look at the list of writers <laughs> on the credits, you know that should tell you enough, right? Um, you know there was. Too many. There were too many cooks. Yeah. Uh, you know, number one, and they were, and they were all great writers unto their own. You know, each one of them was successful writers. I mean, look at Jerry Belson. Uh, you know, he had done. He was already quite a successful writer. The other part of uh, Gary Marshall. Yeah. Uh, you know, so and he directed it. Uh, there was Michael Leeson, who wrote you know War of the Roses, and you know. Uh, uh, Mark Mollis from, from the train. Um, you know, there was quite a few. Uh, Monica Johnson, who was Jerry Belson's sister, I can't, I don't, can't remember how many things she wrote. These are really big writers, but bring them all together, um, and you have too many, you know, cooks. Right. Now, uh, you said something I, I, on Facebook that didn't surprise me. Uh, because the movie is, is kind of uh, about Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, Dr. Hyde is basically a cocaine fiend. And, and you you yeah. said it was pretty true to life. It was almost a documentary. There was a lot of drug use on the set. Is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah. unfortunately. I th I, that was my second thing. There was a lot uh, of that uh, going on. I also think that had a lot to do with it, I think. Um, you know, and, uh, Jerry, I think, admitted that. Um, I think... Uh, you know, he and Mark were very close. So, again, luckily I was not, you know, I was already quite clean. So that was not on me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, so I think that had a, an influence. Um, I, I could see it. And, um, you know, as I said, it was, yeah, it was. Uh, so I think Jerry in, in his editing because that's where it, you know, that's where that kind of high comedy sure. can go, you know. But, I mean, there were things that Jerry had me do as a character that I just completely disagreed with and hated. How did you um, feel about your costumes or lack of? Because they didn't give you very much to them. wear. Yeah, I hated them. Absolutely hated them. 
Um, but, you know, Jerry was going out a million miles an hour. And, you know, there's n not much I could do. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, and then you had, I mean, it was really, you know, the, the brilliance uh, on the film, really, was Larry Gordon. Mm -hmm. That was the creative mind. But unfortunately, Joel Silver uh, was kind of steering the ship. Yeah. And it's so funny what he went on to do um, as a creative. Right, for user. sure. But um, he wasn't so creative on that. Um, so it, I, it, I think that's really what went wrong with it, is that there were just too, there's a lot of creative people, you know, on the, sh but there were just too many. You know, and and uh, and then you know you throw in you know the lead actor and the director, right? You know, d doing drugs and then probably in the editing room as well. And you know, with that kind of high comedy, you can't you can't miss. With, with we had on uh, an actress, one of the cast members that did Fridays with Mark Blankfield, and. and while he was a creative genius and and he went like 150,000 miles a minute like that guy had almost Tourette's or something she had said that that he had the mood swings and the ups and the downs I mean, did you find it difficult to work with Mark Blankfield I'm sorry I didn't get that last part did you did you find it difficult to to work with Mark Blankfield because we've heard from others that while he you know was creative and this and that and everything else that he was not always the easiest to work with because of having the highs and the lows and the ups and the downs with the moods. Well, I mean, he was one of the sweetest. I think well, first of all, he shared the same birthday. Actually, wow. he was also May eighth. He was the sweetest human being I have ever known. Well, I, I can believe but, that, yeah. I can believe that for sure. He really was. Uh, but Mark could go get very melancholy. Yeah. Um, and go, that that's what I did remember about him. He you know, that's, that's very, pretty common. That's pretty common with that kind of comedian. It's, it's almost like a, a yeah. Jim Carrey or, you know, to where they get into their stuff so much. That, that it alters their mood when they're off camera. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one, one of my closest friendships, um, I'm not going to, I can't go into it, okay. actually, really, because I already start to, like, feel myself getting emotional. So, right. one of my, one of my closest uh, friendships was, um, um, Belushi. Um, oh God! Yeah, and I had known him, you know, since uh, Saturday Night Live, you know, because I was in in New York, and um, I was, you know, with him like a week before he died. Oh my God! And and he could, you know, this is somebody who really had. You know, he could be like your brother. Yeah. Um, he could be. He could be so protective over you, um, and like your brother. And then the very like, the next day, he could be a stranger. Mm -hmm. right. I love him so it, much. It's such a great loss. I mean, I was like the biggest, not only SNL but Blues Brothers fan, and him and Dan together was just magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So I mean, if, I, if you want to talk about like brilliance mm -hmm. and a dark side, yeah, um, that is somebody I could give you like the perfect example of. Right. You know, that would be him. Yeah. And um, I thought I can't. I really can't. You know, because I just saw the do a documentary yeah. the other day uh, on on him, and it brought up. A lot. Is, is this so, a, a something new, or is that one they brought out in the eighties? Uh, where it, no, no, it's something new. It's something I, I new. hope so, because that other one was a piece of tripe. You know. No, this is really yeah. good. I gotta see that. This is, this is really good. The only thing I gotta call them on is they didn't mention that you know because Danny Aykroyd mentions says that, you know, he wishes he was there and he, you know, if only he'd been there 
And, uh, but, you know, his brother was there, Peter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Peter was there. So, Pete, I know, Peter was there, uh, with, uh, Jim. Um, all the way up. He was in the other room, you know, uh, when, when, uh, Jim died. So, it's something that they don't talk about, but, um, I guess to make Dan look better, I, I don't know why, mm. but Peter was there. So, uh, uh, otherwise, the, the, the uh, documentary, especially because a lot of it's told from Judy's point yeah. of view, and um, it really shows, you know, what she went through and her journey, and uh, as well as, you know, some of us, as well as some of his friends. Um, but because a, a lot of it has Judy's voice in it, um, I think that it's probably one of the best and most thorough documentaries I've ever seen. Wow. Um, I avoided it, you know, for a little while because I knew what it was going to bring up. Right. Um, uh, you know, it's just because I have, like, put that part away a long time ago. A lot of um, people blame Judy and a lot of people blame John Landis. Well, there's there's no reason to. Yeah. If if anybody, I think Judy was uh, was a prisoner. You know, yeah. if, if anything, she was. You know, she was a coach. She was a codependent as much. Yeah. Nobody nobody knew. You know about drug addiction. It being a disease. And, right. Not back you know, then. You it, it, it didn't you didn't have a rehab. Yeah. Really. Then you know you have to think about that. And what was it? Betty Ford Clinic. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first. Oh. And, and like Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that was it. Yeah. Back then, so nobody really knew, you know, what to do. Well, I'm I'm glad um, you knew John. That that's that's a, a a blessing for you because I wished I would have known him. I was like, did I? I said Jim. Oh my God! You see? Yeah. Yeah. You see, I, I kept saying Jim, John. Yes. Yeah, John. Yeah, I call, I knew everybody knows. So and, and Jim, yeah. Jim, Jim, Jim's. Jim's a, Jim's a good brother too. I mean, he said some very. I remember when that document, not that documentary, that movie that I talked about was a piece of trite, came out. Uh, Jim Belushi and Dan Aykroyd came on some award show. They blasted that movie, and and they should have. That was, that was just terrible. What was that? What was that? Uh, that that movie that came out about uh, John Belushi a long time ago, where he comes and and kind of like hovers over his body and sees his life. They they really. Oh, uh, it was I horrible. know, yeah. and and there was some awards show, and Jim Belushi and and Dan Aykroyd came out, and they really blasted that movie, and really blasted everything that everybody said about John because it just wasn't yeah. fair. Oh my god, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Well, I know um, you, know, you wound up well, doing before we, before okay. we move on from sure. Jekyll and Hyde. I know that Terry had asked you about uh, the costumes, and you hated them. The last yeah. silly scene that I have to ask you about is how did you feel about doing the song? How did that come up? <laughs> did you were you okay with that? Light up my body. <laughs> oh my god, I hated it. <laughs> the only thing that I was proud of, truly, you guys, in the end, was that it was on <laughs> I'm like, this like, it was terrible. I hated it. Oh my god, it's on key. I swear to God, it was on key. That was me. <laughs> you gotta laugh when you're singing "Light Up My Ass" because <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know that is so funny. It's crazy too because for people that like cult movies and stuff, uh, the nurse in the operating room with the lipstick on on the mask because she's you know assisting the operation is Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, the horror hostess, Cassandra yeah, Peterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So anyway, but, you, you know, go ahead. I was just, it just, you know, I didn't, I don't know why, I I guess because I fought with Jerry so much with about my character that I just didn't think what he wanted to do with the character was funny. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought most of it, I was just kind of groan, going, oh, really, you know, especially when he wanted me to have that teddy bear all the time. I just went, <laughs> oh, God. You know, it was such a groan. See, somebody had a little but, girl affliction for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> Oh man, right? Yeah. But but otherwise, you know, I like I never would the kind of comedy I really enjoyed is like when I did Mama's Family. Yeah. I I loved that. Oh I great. Loved that show. You know, I just 
that's the kind of stuff I really enjoy. Yeah, Vicki Lawrence is so great. Yeah, I love that show. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. What was it like doing 90210? I know it wasn't long. You wound up leaving that and got into uh, being a journalist. We want to talk about that. But what was the 90210 thing Experience. like for you? God, I feel so terrible because I'm like talking, you're picking up all the shows that were like terrible. <laughs> 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 like, can we talk about Tour of Duty or 21 Jump Street? You know, these were, like, good experiences. Um, you know, I, that was the show I walked off of, yeah. weirdly enough. Uh, one of the things is because I had, you know, I had done, like, these independent films, uh, you know, that were, that were okay, you know, um, I done Mortal Passions, which for some reason got acting awards. I don't know why. Well, that's too. a popular film. Everybody talks about that one. Yes. Yeah, I mean, even when I was I was doing the acting, the best acting award uh, for it in like Carolina, and uh, but I'm decided to go off of it. I'll go I'll go back to nine hundred two one zero second. But sure, um, you know, I digress. But I remember like when I was getting the acting award for this film, which I didn't think was very good, um, and I'm sitting around with all of these famous, famous Italian actors, I mean, you just name them, name them the greatest Italian actors, and they're the ones who are the judges, and I'm, I'm sitting around and going, I said, why did you vote for me, you know, best actress, I mean, look who I was up against, I was up against, like, uh, Julia Roberts, hmm. you know. Uh, I said, why did you text with me? And they went, yes, the movie was not very good. It's cool. And they're like <laughs> smoking, uh, and drinking the Campari. <laughs> and it's not very good. But uh, you are better than the others. What can I do? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Wow. <laughs> you know, so I'm just like, all right. I'll take it. Uh, so I, I guess 21 yeah. Jump Street was, was fun for you. I mean, uh, hanging out with Johnny Depp and everything? Or was he on the show at that point? Yeah. No, he was he was awesome. Yeah. He saved my life. Really, the truth, and and being friends for quite a while. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I I was supposed to be uh, like in love with Richard Rico, and uh -huh. that's difficult because Richard Rico was in love with himself so much <laughs> that it was it was very it was a, you know it was a lot of competition there. Um, and as soon as I and then you know his his girlfriend came up. Rico's girlfriend came up and she talked about, you know, the mean girls and she, they, you know, she was already, you know, saying, you know, like, oh, you did this gossip thing about Richard and I'm like, oh my God, I don't care. And, you know, and she's, you know, going throughout the hotel and they're all like gossiping and, you know, smearing, the smear gossipy slandering campaign and thinking I really do like Richard and I'm, I'm in the, I remember this thing in the elevator, my head down, going, get me out of here! <laughs> you know, I'm, and I'm in, um, I'm in Vancouver, and Johnny gets on the elevator. I have no scenes with him, but he, he just looked at me, he's like, he says, you know, I can't have, can't go out to dinner tonight, but I can see you know, all your scenes with Rico. He said, here's a hundred dollars. <laughs> Dinner's on me. <laughs> he's like, he said, have dinner. He said, and you know, next couple of next couple of nights or next week, he said, you know, we'll go out and you come over and hang out with me and Peter. It was Peter. Uh, Peter Delaware's a great guy. We met him. Yeah, he's. Thank just, you. Yeah, yes. 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 Yeah, and he's also awesome guy. Awesome yeah, guy. Yeah. Um, and you know. And so that's what I did. I just hung out with Johnny and, and Peter, uh, you know, as often as possible to get away <laughs> when I wasn't hanging out with Rico. Like, I know, but he and his girlfriend was, I know you like me. Mm. I know you really in love with me. And I had oh to do God. these scenes where I like, oh. really like in love with him. <laughs> I, I, I never, I never liked Rico because like, what, whatever happened to him? Not really anything. Look at Johnny Depp. Hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, that, but uh, the other thing is, is, is what I like about the writers, too, on mm -hmm. Jump Street, is if you didn't like your line, if you had trouble with the character, then you could work with writers. Wow. And 
Well, you know, change the line. That doesn't happen they very often. Wow. No, it was, and that was uh, typical of. Um, oh my God, I forgot the the producer of that. The production. He's really famous. The guy who was the, the production, Gary David, mm-hmm. something, um, of all of his shows, where you were involved in the creative process. You know, and, and I like that. And we were in Vancouver, and the writers were in Los Angeles, so it's not like we were all in the same room. Mm. You know, so you could rehearse something, and, you know, if you didn't like something, and you could talk with the writers, and, you know, we didn't have a Zoom thing, you know, you'd get on like a call. And they were like, okay, well, let us work with it. We'll send you something tomorrow. And, you know, you felt like you were involved in the creative process. So that's oh. what was wonderful about it. Well, Stephen, so t- Stephen Cannell, who was responsible that's for creating is. 21 Jump Street, was known for that kind of thing. Because, yeah. you know, he did that with Silk Stockings. Yeah. He did that with the A-Team. He did that with a lot of the, of the shows that he was involved with. For sure. Yeah, that's who it was. Cannell, yes. He's known for that. Exactly. Well, to take your your acting career, and first of all, I got to ask you, why did you leave acting and go into journalism? Now, I have great respect for you for going into journalism. I, I feel like like you're one of my people for sure, and and you've done great work for that. Thank but how that transition? Because a lot of people wouldn't give up acting uh, to be a journalist because journalists you either like them or you don't. Sometimes they get a bad rap. Sometimes they deserve it. Sometimes well, they don't. But it's an honorable that, profession. Yeah, journalism is not something that you necessarily will get famous for or get accolades for. A lot of times, it's a very gritty and thankless job, depending on you know what subject matter well, you're covering. It used to be a respected job till Trump came along and, well, and said what he did yeah. about journalists. But <laughs> so, how did that whole transition right. thing happen? And you know, and state TV. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're basically just, they were just basically adolescents who were jealous mm-hmm. because they're not journalists. Yeah. That's basically right. it. <laughs> right. Um, I, th- this is the story. Um, I was already going back and forth from uh, Los Angeles to Italy because my, my uh, acting maestro uh, was teaching there. Um, so I was getting to know the Italians. Uh, you know, pretty well. And I had kind of fallen in love with an Italian journalist. And he really opened my eyes, you know, to the political world. Um, and especially the, the world of the Middle East. Right. Um, and, and, and he was especially the, you know, the Hezbollah and, and, you know, Iran and all of that. That's, that, that, that was his area. Uh, in the meantime, you know, back in Los Angeles, um, I am doing Beverly Hills 90210. Now, I'm giving you an, uh, like this arc where I've gone through this period between, let's say, you know, Hello Larry and Little Darlings and Jekyll and Hyde, and then I went through this long period of, uh, you know, doing some creative films and, and some guest stars and TV series that I really had uh, enjoyed. Um, and I'm also really starting to master my craft as right. an actor. You know, I've also become a member of the actor studio, so I, I felt like I've met my my godfather and my grandfather. You know, I, I'm on their level now. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, you earned your stripes. And that's right. I've earned my stripes. I'm, you know, I'm. I did it finally, and I land now two one zero, and. You know, they let me know if I'm a really good girl, you know, that um, they want me to go on to do Melrose Place after this. Mm-hmm. So I get on the show, and the next thing I know, I am being treated like I was 16 years old on Hello Larry, right? Back at Tandem PAT, mm. which is like, you know, under the studio system. And since all my scenes were with. Uh, Corey and Shannon um, every time they did not like something I was wearing because it was just too revealing it was too competitive um, it, it threatened them yeah. uh, I, you know, I had to change um, so I went through a lot of costume changes now my, my character as it was was supposed to be a sophisticated you know Parisian so that made it very difficult to change 
me in costume in a way that was not going to make them feel threatened. Wow. And, uh, you know, at this time I was 27 years old, and I, I'm like, I'm, I'm a little tired of this shit. Yeah, right, you know? exactly. Right. I, I, I just want to, I just want to do my job, get paid, and, and go home. You know, I, I want to enjoy what I'm doing. But I, I'm, so I've got this going on. Which I got to the point, actually, where as soon as I had put one look of Shannon's face, and I would just turn around and walk, go, I'll change, you know, and I would just, you know, just, it was just over. Then, on top of that, there was a gossip, you know, that would go on on, on the set. Uh, you know, we hear you're demanding uh, that you want herbal cigarettes. Uh, we, you know, then my agent would call and say, "What are you demanding?" I'm like, "Oh my God, I'm just, <laughs> I know the kid smokes, but you know, I don't smoke." Yeah. And uh, you know, I just want some herb cigarettes. Well, you can't be that demanding. I'm like, "Oh my God!" It, it was just like one thing after another. Now I'm demanding. You know, uh, and Shannon it, it, had like a reputation, but but. Tori, I had a little encounter with her. Yeah, she was a little bitch. <laughs> oh, the two of them were nightmares. They were awful. And then they fomented a set like that. Mm. They had they fomented a backbiting. The prop department were like that. They would report you for anything. Wow. Oh my god! Uh, you know they, they were. You know they. Uh, I can't. It was just. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Um, what about the guys? Uh, were the guys any better? The guys were fabulous. Good. All the guys were cool. The actors were. Yeah. But the, the set, I mean, but the crew were was a different story. Mm -hmm. You know, the crew, at least the, the crew that I worked with, because I always worked with Tori and Shannon. Yeah. And it was like a mean girl set. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, so I get a phone call, you know, from my fiancé. You know, in um, in Italy, we've been talking while I've been doing this this show, right? And he says, "I got the clearance to go to Iran." Hmm. Um, and he said, "I've got your visa." Wow! Oh. And he, he said, we, uh, "I have to be there in a week, and um, you'll be the first American to go to Iran since the '78 revolution." Did, did you? Did he, he work for RAI? Yes. Yeah. Yes. He was the well, he was the head correspondent in the in the Middle East, and he said, um, "Make your decision. You got a week. I got a visa." And I'm and here I am. I'm I'm, I'm on the set, and another little fight breaks out. <laughs> right um, on the set, I'm watching this, and I'm sitting on my little seat. And it says Krista Erickson. And, um, you know, and it's like I got, I'm waiting for it, and like it's the day before I'm supposed to leave, right, mm -hmm. to go to Tehran. And I'm like going, if I have to die tomorrow, and what's going to be written about me? That I did nine, Beverly Hills 90210? <laughs> or that I was the first female journalist that went to Iran yeah. right. and reported on it. Which one do I want to take the risk on? So I decided, I just dropped my script right there. And I walked off the set. And I got on a plane, I went to Italy, and 48 hours later I was in Tehran. Wow. Wow. The thing that's so incredible I want you to talk about this is you actually were involved with helping to negotiate the release of a prisoner, which was a fellow journalist. Yeah. How did yeah, that come Italian about? Journalist. Yeah. Yeah. Italian journalist. Yeah, Daniel well, Master Giacomo. What happened there? Uh, the Taliban had kidnapped uh, an Ilmasagero uh, journalist named Daniela Master Giacomo. And I had been um, studying uh, the head of the Taliban uh, for quite some time, and they had sent an envoy uh, to 
um, to Afghanistan uh, to try to negotiate with them uh, to for his release. They hadn't had much success, um, you know, especially, you know, Daniel Pearl had only happened like the year before. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. In, in, in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. And because I, I knew about him so much um, that they wanted to use me, uh, you know, use me and my expertise in dealing with him. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I offered what I could. I mean, it wasn't just me. There was, you know, a, a group of ten of us. But I was, you know, glad to be uh, a part of it. I would tell you there was some fright. I mean, you know, we there was at least three or four days there where we, where we, we all just slept on cots. And every time they sent us a, a tape, you know, we were we just held onto your seat. Yeah. Because, you know, you just didn't know, is this the time where, where the, you know, where they've cut his head off? Yeah. You know, what's going to be on the tape? What have they sent us back? Uh, that, that was horrifying. Um, I, I, I was more than thrilled. I, I wish I could say that I, you know, was there, like in this movie moment. You know, that they released him and I shook his hand, you know, in the spotlight, you know, as he crossed it, you know, but that's not what happened. I, I know I was able to, he was released to an embassy and, you know, I heard a few days later that, you know, he was uh, home. Right. See, um, this, this is the kind of thing that makes a journalist and, and all this shit that Trump says about journalists, he doesn't fucking have a clue, you know? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Um, that's right. I mean, being no. This is what being a journalist is. It's yes. Being sitting in uh, sitting, being head to toe in uh, in a burka. Uh, because I don't walk around with a flat jacket. You yeah. know, like a lot of the females. This is like why don't you just put a target on your back? You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get that. Right. Um, you know, with a microphone. So I'm recording from. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't get that. I just think that's stupid. Um, you know, I'm in a Bertha, um, and you know, you, I'm sitting at a stadium in in Afghanistan. You know, and I am watching two people uh, being stoned to death. Mm for what they say is adultery. And uh, I have to, or, I'll give you another example. Uh, being in a, in a Shador, see a burqa, as you know, in Afghanistan is that thing from head to toe, right. uh, where you just have like a beekeeper uh, view. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, another is being in a Shador, which is that black, thing that you see mm-hmm. uh, you know with Iranians with the Hezbollah wear seated and having a Kalashnikov pointed at your head mm-hmm. and but you have tape to your that's one thing about the Shador which is great is you can hide things and I had tapes taped to my body of interviews of people of people in Iran Especially people who, if they if they had gotten to the government, they would have been killed. For sure, yes. Uh, and, and I would have been killed for for inter- for you know interviewing them. So the whole crew would have been, but especially since I had it on my body. Right. So I had a tape, and I, I just had to sit there very quietly while my he eventually became my husband. Um, would not turn over the footage. Uh, to them as because we were leaving. That's what being a journalist is. How it's close were you to being? How close were you to being caught? Did you ever have any close calls? Did they almost catch you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you saw that, that if you ever saw that Ben Affleck movie, mm-hmm. uh, where you know he was in Iran, you know, and did you see that movie? No. Well, uh, at one point they're pursuing him. Uh, at the you know while he's trying to get them out at the airport, mm-hmm. um, 
uh, he's trying to get the hostages out, and they're going to the to the Tehran airport, and they're trying to get like on the flight. You know, I mean, it's exactly what we went through. You know, we wow. they released us. Um, we got luckily, I was speaking Italian. You know, so they didn't think I was an American. Good. Right. Um, yeah, that would help. So I got out. So the closest call was Iran, um, and that was when I had the Kalashnikov, and I had I had all the tapes on my body. You know that that was the incriminating evidence, not what was the footage that they wanted. Yeah. That they thought they wanted. You know, the the real stuff was was on my person, <laughs> and. So we thought we were okay until we got in the taxi and we knew we were being pursued. Mm. And um, that's the closest call. It's got to be a terrible feeling, shit. Wow. So, and I, in fact, you know, it's, it's funny, Terry. A lot of times I would post on Twitter when they would talk about especially when Shamity and Dr. Carlson. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, guys. Sorry, radio. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we talk about, you know, they say journalists and fake this, and I would post, you know, photos of my colleagues, you know, in the war zone being shot at, yeah. you know, standing in front of battle zones, and I'm like, really? Why don't you go out there? Why don't yeah. you take his place? Hmm. Okay? You know, hey, colleague, Okay, why don't you go out there and do this? You know, he, he needs a break. Why don't you go out there? Right. Okay, Sean. Exactly. So, yeah, you're right. So it's, who do you, who do you think we have to worry about more, uh, Iran or, or China or maybe Russia? Who do you think would most likely engage in nuclear war with us? <laughs> okay, That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say... I would say at this point it's our own president. <laughs> <laughs> I never, yeah, I never. Sadly, th- sadly, that's true. Yeah. Sadly, that is true. It all started with him building a wall to keep Mexicans from coming into the country. Now we're having to build a wall around the capital to keep his that's followers right. from. That's incredible. That's, that's incredible. Right. Do, do you that's think right. that he's going to behave, or do we have something to worry about? I'm worried about, like Nancy Pelosi this week has went to the military generals worried about him knowing the codes. How worried are you yeah, about it? And you, I think, you know, they've assured her that they've taken, you know, the codes away from him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't know. You know, what I'm more worried about is, you know, the, the is Fox News, frankly, frankly. I'm more worried about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, my own family are still, like, completely brainwashed and think I'm deranged. And and I'm a journalist, yeah. okay? <laughs> you know, so they think I'm completely deranged. Mm-hmm. And I thought after our capital, you know, was attacked. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they're in the, they're ex-military, okay? Um, and they still think they're patriots, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you turn on state TV and you'll see the counter narrative. You know, that what they're showing are, they're showing all the clips that they can of Portland, you know, their Benghazi. Uh, you know, the Portland, their best video clips of, you know, the fireman crying because he couldn't get to the baby because there were protesters in the street with their parked cars. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're, they're showing everything from like May and June of, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter because they're all one person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or, or the, and that's the way they're trying to count, show the counter narrative as if it's the same thing. And that worries me because it shows their viewers as if there's it's the same thing. Yeah. As as if, you know, the invasion of our capital, which has not been, uh, which has, you know, which has not had an enemy attack it since the British. Right. Right. 
Okay, we have the Confederate flag never even made it into one of our capitals, even during the Civil War. Right. But it made it in January. Tw- it, it made it January sixth, twenty twenty one. Yeah. Um, but it, it still doesn't dawn on Rupert Murdoch to stop. Still isn't stopping. Right. They still do their counter. Propaganda. You're talking about and Fox, and that's, right, the thing, yeah. that's the thing that I don't understand that Terry and I have talked about is that the the level of, of brainwashing, it, it, it's like I don't understand. Like It's like they've been given this Kool-Aid that they just believe and like no matter what he says or does or or how people are guided, they don't see the forest for the trees and that's that, I think is the most frightening thing because they can be the masses that that follow and listen can be guided to believe anything it's like when is this right. a, when is this awakening going to happen it's like people are slowly right. i think with some of the some of the republicans that recanted you know their their dispute uh, I think slowly some people are starting to wake up from this nightmare, but there's still a very large volume of people yeah. that, that aren't. It, it's what would have happened if Charles Manson would have been elected president. Because like Hitler yeah. and like people like them, they have that persuasive, hypnotizing thing that they can just control people. I don't know, and it's very dangerous. But, but they didn't have a, a, a channel right. that goes into their... You know, this is, you know, guys, I'll tell you, when we were just speaking about Iran, I said to, when I was there in Iran, and Iran is, is what from, different from what you see on the television, you know, of this wave of like, you know, black shadows and, uh, you know, these radicals. Um, Iran is not an Arab country. They were Aryan. That's why it's called Iran. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they were very, they're still a very sophisticated people. They were like, you know, Fifth Avenue in, in 1976, you know, 77. She's a very sophisticated, well read society. Yeah. Okay? That's what shocked me when I went there. I think that's what shocked me more than anything. Yeah, that's surprising. Like, this was not, these were not like barbarians. Okay, um, most of the people who still live there, and that's where that's where I had these these, these uh, tapes. Um, people who still live there, I mean, behind closed doors, they're as hedonistic as anybody. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, they drink, they they have parties. Uh, you know, they they're, they're definitely atheists. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, that's what's shocking when I was on the airplane. You know, you would see women with their red nail polish and their you know, the Chanel belts and the red lipstick and you know, drinking champagne. And as soon as we entered Iranian airspace, you know, you would see the, the bathrooms that just were occupied, 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 and you'd come out and they looked like nuns. Mm. Right. Yeah. You know, they'd touch the doors, they'd be very plain, you know, and it's all, it's all, it's all, you know, just a, it's just a facade. That's all it is. And I, while I was there, I turned to my Italian husband, who, you know, loved America, just loved America, was in love with America, as were my stepson. And I said, Kiel, you know what frightens me? And this was, Fox News had been on the air about three years by then. And I also knew my family. And my family lived in rural Pennsylvania, very isolated. Um, and although they were intelligent, they were not knowledgeable. Yeah. You know? And they already had a healthy distrust of anybody who read. You know? And I turned to Piero and I said, Piero, I said, there's something that frightens me. This could happen in the United States. It, this could happen. And he, he laughed at me. He said, oh, you know, he, he was so, he was so incredulous to him that something like this could happen because the one thing that, that the world has always overestimated, especially Europeans, and that is the intelligence of the American people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and 
no one, that's what I think the world has finally understood. It, it, they still didn't get it until probably just now. Yeah. yeah. But the capital, they finally understood, no, this is America. Now, how closely did you work with the Biden campaign? You were working for and with the Biden campaign, right? Yeah, yeah, I was. Yep, I was. I worked pretty, until I until I asked if I could more closely work with Republicans <laughs> 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 because they were as nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I because you know, I just said you guys don't get it. You know, they they're not. You know, because. Joe is great. He just thinks, you know, everyone's going to come to this, you know, kumbaya moment. And <laughs> I, I'm like, they're not. They're not, <laughs> yeah. They're not. The, the whole not. the whole petty stuff of all the images of Biden walking with a walker and he's got Alzheimer's. Trump's only five years younger, but they make off like, oh, Biden's an old man. And, and Trump is better because he's young. He's five years younger is all. I know. Yeah. yeah. And that's the, I mean, if you... If you said anything like, you know, he'd be the oldest president. It's like, well, you know, if he was elected, he'd be the oldest president. Yeah. It's yeah. like, the hypocrisy is just lost. Lost, it's gone, you know, but yes. As I said, when you said to me, what's more worrisome, what other country would be worrisome, I continue to say, it's it's a channel, and it's, it's, my, it's my own country, and it's this channel, it's Fox News. Yeah. They are more dangerous than any foreign country could be. Well, at and least if, it, if you had to me, I would say China. Right. Yeah. No, I I think so too. Uh, I, at least Facebook and Twitter stood up and, and banned Trump. I think because at least it cut off one form of his communication. But he'll just go on Fox. But but yeah, for sure. I, I did want to give you a real quick chance to mention you, you produced some great documentaries working with some big networks on, on like genetic engineering and everything. I mean, uh -huh. they had cloning and, and, and received great accolades for it. What's some of the stuff you did? Um, I did a whole series on the genetic revolution. Uh, so, you know, back I already was revealing like what Monsanto was doing. Yeah, I gotta and, watch that. Uh, I'm into that stuff. I gotta see this uh, thing. That yeah, you did. yeah. Like in 1999, mm -hmm. you know, I was already talking about, you know, what Monsanto was doing. Um, I was uh, talking about. They're still not talking about. Still waiting for them to come out with that. Um, the the human uh, the patenting of human genes. Mm -hmm. um, you know. So I'm still doing it, and the fact that insurance companies, uh, you know, when you get your blood test, yeah, uh, look at they, they, you know, they know what diseases you're going to get. Hmm. Um, so they're trying to find ways where they don't have to cover you. Yeah, mm. uh, that was back then. Uh, so you know, that was the, the patenting of of indigenous popu pop populations. Right. Um, we were doing that back then, where. Uh, they, the universities would send out uh, under the auspices of um, of like the, the, the they would go out to the, because the indigenous popula populations like the Indian you know the, in the the remote areas because they don't you know uh, uh, go uh, they don't mix so much outside of the villages their their genetic uh, imprint. Uh, is is uh, you know is particular so so they could have a genetic strand that can be patented and even though they don't know what could be special in that genetic strand they still have pharmaceuticals that are patenting them yeah. because if somebody does develop mm. something from that from that genetic uh, you know population that indigenous species then they already own the patent right yeah then they can charge an arm and a leg for it too there, there's so many things we don't know yeah. of course it's, it's quite possible COVID-19 was a mistake that happened in China do you think there's more to it I don't want to I don't know about getting into conspiracy theories but do you think that this was deliberate that there was more people behind it than we would know maybe even our own people or, or do you think no. it's just what they said no, no, I no. I think it is just what they said. I happen to, 
I looked into the research. I looked into the um, the virologist who runs that lab. Mm -hmm. um, I looked into her reputation. I looked into uh, the you know the other uh, you know uh, virologists who know about her, and she is you know she is uh, stellar. You know, she is one of the top in the world, and, uh, you know, this is, it's, you know, there's no reason to have a conspiracy that it was cooked up in a lab. Um, it came from a bat, um, as coronaviruses do, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it was named, uh, they gave out the information very early, and um, un unfortunately, they are what China did after that, you know, is what China does. Yeah, shut but, it But, yeah, exactly. But other than that, uh, where that lab in China uh, is, very, is very famous and very well known um, for what they do. Yeah. And they're not known to do those things. Um, and, you know, you just that's what you do. You know, you go for the names, you go for who they are, you go backwards. You know, who are they? How long have they been known? What do other doctors say about them? Um, you know, and and you just, at that point, you go, okay, that's enough for me. Right. You know, and then you just have to go, stop. You know, I was, just, I was one of the people, because my mom, you know, loved John Kennedy, mm -hmm. and she was convinced that, you know, it was, a, it was a conspiracy. I was convinced it was a conspiracy. Um, you know, until I saw... Uh, one documentary that was done, it was very well done, and it just said, I mean, it, it showed the most advanced technology, um, and it just said, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we explained the magic bullet, you know, we, we'd like it to be something else, but it, it was really Harvey Oswald. Yeah. That's, that's what it was. It, it's, it's too easy for me to go off in a conspiracy, just like when Trump will say something stupid like, stay tuned, you're like, What's he doing? What's he planning? And I worry yeah. too much, you know. Do you worry he's going to be doing more? I mean, do you think the inauguration is going to go off well and safe, hopefully? Pray to God. No. No? No. No, I think that, I mean, I'll say one thing. If the moon, one of the things I want to say about these conspiracy theories mm -hmm. is if the moon landing was fake, if JFK was assassinated, and all these other secrets, we would have known about them already because Trump can't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah. You know, so so that's for sure. And you know, unfortunately, if like there were aliens, he would tell us there was people from outer space. I'd like to believe there's aliens, but <laughs> that's right. I mean, it's, you know, if whatever was there, whatever was at Area 51, you know, we would already know about it. Yeah. Right. If they said Trump can't keep his mouth shut, he'd already be taking photos with it. <laughs> <laughs> so we Put selfies but on Twitter. There's no, yeah. There's no way he keep his mouth shut. So we know for sure yeah. that there's you know nothing that's being hidden because you know how they say you know when you have a thirty third degree, mm. you know, this is stuff that only the presidents know. Yeah. But right. well, we know they don't know that because Trump couldn't keep his freaking mouth shut. Right. I, I don't understand but, the religious community supporting him. I really don't because I d I don't get it. He's far from a religious icon. I saw everything that was coming early on. We had to get rid of one of our radio hosts that was a Trump follower because he was putting swastikas stickers all over the radio station fan page. and, and just, It's just incredible. Well, this yeah. is a crazy time. Well, look, I'll tell you, Terry, you know, I've known Trump personally since I was 13 years old, okay? As in in real um, life? I mean, you met him and all that? I, I, yeah, unfortunately. Mm. Uh and his buddy, Jeff Epstein. Mm. Uh, and and my own brother-in-law says to me, if you have never met Trump, you wouldn't be fit to sign his shoe. <laughs> okay? Because they, they created this, this is my own family, you yeah. understand? Because they have created, it's, it's, somebody explained it to me well. There's the difference between, like, a, an Obama 
and a Trump is Obama represented people. Yeah. Trump is them. There's no difference. So, for me, if I'm insulting Trump, I'm insulting him. Right. It is their identity. So, he can't separate, like, who I am now than who I was at 13, 14. Mm. You know, he, he can't see it because then that that he has to put that reality right. in there and they can't get that you see so if you if you can think that that is my own life and that's my own family can you imagine somebody in you know north dakota yeah well in saying you knew trump you knew epstein i hope they didn't try to put you in an uncomfortable situation and of course it, they did they did okay I'm sorry for that. Of course they did, but not, uh, don't look. It was a, it's a, it goes with the territory. The good thing was, is I was, you know, I was sweet smart. Yeah. And he was so bad at it. He was so smarmy and bad at it. You know, I just went, yeah. You know, I, I, the New York girls were smarter. For sure. Than that. He, he had to get, you know, the new ones right off the boat. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, we have really well, I appreciated have to, this. I have to, just as we wrap this up, yeah. Krista, I have to tell you, like, you have had such an, a, an amazing and interesting journey and a life. I implore you at some point, write, write an autobiography. Yeah. Write about your life and everything that you've gone through and everything that you've seen. I mean, because not only from, you know, a lot of actors do that, but you have this amazing kind of full circle revolution because yeah you've done the acting thing and the this and the that but you've also done the journalism thing and you've taken the time to research and see the world from really a different standpoint than what most people actually get to it's refreshing to talk to an actor who wasn't all just about fluffing themselves i mean right it's been a great intelligent conversation i really appreciate it Oh, thank you guys so much. And I really thank you. I really appreciate the conversation you guys are having with me. I, uh, it's really fun to have. I don't get to have it that often. Do you think you might write a book but someday? I, you know, I have, I have been writing one. You know, I am just, um, you know, I just try to remember, you know, that I'm terrible with discipline. I am really, really just the worst. Uh, when it comes to discipline, well, I just have to remember one of the great one, one of the great writers said, "It's just it's easy to write. You just have to sit at the uh, sit at the typewriter until blood comes out of your eyes." Yes, right. that, that's what right. you got to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, are yeah. you going to be watching inauguration on TV then, or? Uh, that's you know, unfortunately, uh, that was the other downside about the inauguration is uh, the Biden. Uh, the Biden-Harris inauguration just let us know that we're all going to be virtual. Yeah. Mm. So my, my ticket, my physical ticket just turned to a virtual ticket. Right. And uh, that, it just, of course, that's another thing that enraged me. I was like, you fucker, he yeah. yeah. me. Well, it's, yeah. it's a disappointment, but it's kind of a dangerous place to be. I don't think Biden should do anything out in public. I mean, even for, like, yeah. the closed-in guests they're inviting and everything, I'm worried about the whole damn thing. I'm going crazy. I just want this thing to be I over. I know. Yeah. yeah. I know. Well, let's hope, that, know. Let's, I, let's hope that the impeachment uh, proceedings start on Monday, as they're supposed to, because the next thing they need to do, because, you know, if you're going to open the lid and try to kill the vampire, you got to put the stake in. Yeah, don't to, just open the lid. They have that voting, if they have that judgment to keep him from running again, because he's going to be back in four years if they don't. Yeah, I don't think he will be. I don't think so either. I hope not. Especially if they get this passed. A a criminal is a criminal is a criminal. Okay? It's not like he's going to stop being one. Yeah. You know? Uh, The day he leaves. Or his family. They can't stop. They always have been. He always has been. I mean, that was one of the things in New York, you know, we thought about. When he became president, we're like, how's he going to stop being a criminal? (laughs) You know? Right. Everybody in New York knew that. You know, everyone was like, what are you talking about? He's been in bed with the Russians, yeah. you know, and all these oligarchs. How is he going to not get, go through investigation? 
How are you going to not be investigated for being with, in the bed with Russians as the president? You, you know, know, everybody says it was a, a fluke that he got in, and you can kind of relate to this and being in that land of Hollywood that you lived in. He got in because of being on TV and his little movie cameos and being a semi-celebrity. They just don't even think about it. What they should have thought about is he had a bad reputation before he was anybody. Yeah. I mean, back when he was a private citizen, an actor, whatever he wanted to be, yeah, I mean, uh, a how TV many host. Uh, he had filed bankruptcy. He had been sued for the you know so many things, falsifying contracts, falsifying educational institutions. I like. Why was this a good idea, people? Like why? <laughs> I, 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 you know, as you said, and what, you know, what Terry said, you know, you just, they seem, you know, they popped up like, you know, the falling apart, you know, conference room that they had to paint, you know, and make it look, you know, rich, you know, and everything. And, and, the, you know, they believe what they saw, you know, on, on TV. I mean, right. this is, that's what we were, but, you're right, they're like, you know, you tried to make our president look like, you know, he was a criminal. No! He was, we were wondering how he was going to not look like one. <laughs> Actually, he was all anyone. What are right. you talking about? They want to put a celebrity you know, in the White House, they should have voted in Mark Blankfield. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh my goodness! All right, well, Krista, I, I want to thank you so much for spending uh, so much time with us this weekend, and I will personally be messaging you on January twentieth, just once we can all breathe a collective sigh oh, of relief. Yes. And uh, please keep in touch. We have had so much fun, and it's been such an interesting conversation. We'd love to have you come back on any time to talk about anything, whether it's you know. Hollywood industry stuff or news stuff or politics, any of that, we would love to have you join and, us again. And, and stay safe and when you go to bed tonight, you need to be proud of yourself because I am. You've done something with your life. Yes. You know, you, you've made things happen and for the good and for women and for everybody. Thank you guys. I'm so honored. That makes me feel so good. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Absolutely. Thank have you so much. And I, before we go, I just want to say one thing yes. to anybody listening. Please read Please read. It doesn't matter really whether you, you know, are good, good in school or you know, not. You do well or you don't do well. Pick up a book. Yeah. Just that's all you need. Right. You can change your stars with a vocabulary. For yeah. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Will you take care, Krista? You too. Thanks. Thanks again, you guys. Thank okay. you so much, Krista. Bye-bye. Have a great rest of your weekend. Okay. All right. You too. All Thanks right. again. Yes, thank yep. you. It was great. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.